Hi, so my name is Justin Pettit. I am uh, one of the core developers on the Open vSwitch project, and I'm here to talk about uh, Open vSwitch and the Intelligent Edge. So for the purposes of this discussion, we are um, going to call the Edge the, uh, the hypervisor, really. So you can see in this diagram you have the, uh, the virtual machines uh, running inside the hypervisor with OVS. And so this constitutes the Edge before it sends packets out into the, to the greater network here. So the, intel the, the Edge is really at a unique position uh, within the network. Uh, so it's got the benefits of uh, isolation that a guest uh, agent that would do it, be doing this uh, sort of protection um, does, not, does not have. Um, and then it has greater context than an in-network device. So with, a, uh, with an in-network device, it either has to infer the state on tags, or sorry, on um, packet headers that can be easily spoofed, or if you have tags, uh, the, the tags are usually limited in size, so quite often you might see VLAN tags being used, and those would only have 12 bits of data that could contain all the context about that flow that's coming through. And then, uh, as I mentioned, that if you uh, want to have run in the guest, which has a lot more context, then you risk having that agent attacked uh, because it's co-located with, uh, with the code that's running. Uh, another advantage is that you get to enforce the policies earlier. Uh, because the uh, the services are um, the uh, enforcement is happening right next to where the the traffic is being generated or it's being sent, and in a lot of cloud environments you have oversubscribed links, and so it's nice to be able to enforce that earlier before you send the traffic out on the link, and then also oftentimes the guests are not trusted, and so you know better to. Uh, enforce that policy at the hypervisor when you know where that traffic is coming from and put it out in the network and then where that can be a little bit more difficult to determine. Uh, you also have uh, the ability for different parts of the system to, um, to communicate with each other. So for example, if you had a service VM that is running an intrusion detection system, if it detects that there's some sort of problem, it can communicate with the networking subsystem, for example OVS, and isolate the traffic from that system that's been determined to be compromised. <clears throat> so. To mention, this is an ideal location for uh, network control and visibility. And so we're able to infer state uh, by observing traffic as it goes by. Uh, and then we also have the ability to do some introspection by uh, looking in the guest if you have some uh, small amount of code that's running in the, uh, as an agent. And we'll talk about both of these a little bit later. Uh, also, at this point in the network, we have, um, if you're running an overlay network where you're taking traffic and you're sticking it into a tunnel, that overlay is done actually at the edge. So we know that mapping of the logical traffic to the physical. So if we want to do something with that traffic, we know what it looks like when it's going to be on the wire, where that can be a little bit more difficult once you stick it in the tunnel and you send it out um, into, the, into the fabric. <clears throat> so the first two um, uh, bullet points I have here about uh, in modifying behavior are things that you can currently do in OVS. So uh, since we're at the ingress and egress of the tunnel, uh, we can enforce policy um, you know, at the very beginning or at the very end as the traffic is uh, going in or out of the tunnel. Uh, we can also modify bits in the, uh, the inner packet or the outer packet. So for example, if we wanted to do some uh, DSCP marking, we can do that um, on the outer packet based on information that we saw in the inner packet. And I'll show some examples of that later on. Uh, these last three are things that we've been sort of investigating for um, you know, other things that we can do. Uh, at the edge. One of them is TCP pacing, which is that right now if you have a traffic that is being sent from a VM and it's TCP traffic, it may get um, sent as large segments, called, uh, to be called TSO segments, that get sent to the NIC and then the NIC breaks them up into MTU size and it just jams them out on the network as fast as possible. We've talked to a couple of NIC vendors about possibly uh, doing what we call TCP pacing which is that you send these large segments uh, into the NIC, but then the NIC actually, rather than just saying them all at once, it paces them out a little bit so that you don't fill buffers up um, along the way. We also looked at um, sort of doing the opposite, which is sometimes when you have all these TCP stacks uh, communicating and they're going through a single box, they can, um, you can end up with synchronization of the, of the TCP states, and so then you end up filling the buffers because everyone is sort of following traffic in the same way. And so by introducing a little bit of jitter every once in a while, you can, you can break that up. And then another option would be uh, flowlets, which is a research paper that was done, where the idea is that you are able to take 
uh, traffic, and you, you can send a single TCP stream, for example, over um, multiple links by uh, judging what the round trip time is and then making sure that you don't send, uh, to keep them in order, you make sure that you um, choose different links uh, once they've cleared the, the total round trip time. And so these are all areas that we're, we're actively looking at um, adding support to. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, inferring the, the state, this is something that is commonly done on, uh, currently on, uh, on switches and people who are uh, implementing policies. Uh, the most common one is uh, if you don't, if OpenStack a lot of times will have the MAC address or the IP address, but if you don't, you can learn the MAC and the IP address the first time that VM comes up and starts communicating. Uh, something that uh, we don't currently have support for in OVS, but people have written daemons for, is to do IGMP and DHCP snooping so that you can learn the, uh, the group or the IP address um, that is being used by the guest VM dynamically. And then um, yeah, you can see, obviously, uh, which pairs uh, of systems are talking, and you can see their flow characteristics. And so this is the advantage of being at the edge and seeing all of the traffic that your, your guests are producing. A newer area that uh, we've started looking at is using guest introspection. And so the idea there is that you actually have an agent that's running in the VM, and that communicates with a daemon that's running in the hypervisor. And that daemon can query that agent that's running in the guest to find out information about, the, uh, about what's going on in that guest. So um, yeah, the, I had mentioned before that there is some risk in terms of running agents in the guest, and that's still true. But the idea with this agent is that the code is, very, is relatively small. You're not actually doing enforcement there. It's just returning information. And, it's, uh, and what you can do if you're hosting that in a hypervisor is that you can mark those pages as read-only since they don't have to maintain any state. They're just retrieving data. And the hypervisor will actually um, fault if anybody uh, tries to modify those pages in the guest. So you end up having a smaller, you do have some code that's running there, but it's relatively small and it's protected by the hypervisor. So the types of data that such an agent could get are uh, the users that are on the system. Uh, it can look at all traffic and it can determine who it is that is uh, generating that traffic uh, for each flow, um, both the user and the application. And when you identify the application, you can, you know, not only can you identify, oh, this happens to be Firefox or IIS, but you can actually determine the version. So for example, you could pull the, the hash, the MD5, or the SHA-1 hash of, of the binary, and there's services like Bit9 that will actually be able to take that hash and tell you uh, for this, uh, this particular hash, it's this version. And then if you know that that has a vulnerability, then you can enforce your policies based on, on, the, uh, on that information. Uh, so in addition to um, all of these identity things, you can look at the uh, data transfer rates, uh, the socket queue depth, so that if a particular application is sending traffic more quickly than it can be put in the network, you can look to see, you can identify that, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then general system characteristics of the box, uh, for example, the, the kernel version or anything else you'd want to query about the, the system. So as you can imagine, there's uh, quite a few applications for using this state. You know, for QOS and load balancing, you can imagine that you know, if you, now you could actually um, make these, um, these decisions based on the user or the application uh, in much finer uh, granularity than you were able to before. Uh, you can also select traffic to be sent uh, to different middle, middle boxes depending on what the application is. It's, and that's something that NFV is, uh, is doing. Uh, and then you can implement better, better firewalls and elephant flow detection. And that's what the rest of the talk will actually be about these last two bullet points. So currently in OVS, uh, there are basically two ways to implement a, a firewall. Uh, the first, which is something that we added uh, just a couple of releases ago, is the ability to match on the TCP flags. And so to enforce this, what you would do is you would write your policy based on, uh, on the SIN flag. So you would either allow or deny the traffic based on, on SIN. And then you'd allow all ACK and resets through. <clears throat> and so this, um, so doing this is fast. We can generate, um, we, one of the things that we introduced in version 1.10 is megaflows, which allows wildcarding in the kernel. So these flags, uh, flag matching can actually be pushed down to the kernel and it's very fast. Um, and then this is actually how a lot of hardware ASICs implement their firewall policies as well, because they can't actually maintain the state of uh, all the flows that are going through the system, so they'll, they'll do flag matching. 
The problem, as you can imagine, is that you know, we're not actually, we're not keeping track of the flows. So um, you can uh, get through, you're allowing all the ACK and any packet with an ACK or a reset through, which means that certain kinds of scanning and other security, there's certain security implications of doing that. It also only works with TCP. Uh, the other way, which is I think how OpenStack is currently doing, um, doing firewalls, is to use this learn action extension that we have in OVS. And what you do there is that you implement your policy on port 80, let's say, that allows the traffic through, and then you um, write a new OpenFlow rule um, dynamically um, based on the, the five tuple, sort of the reverse direction, to allow that traffic. And that's much more secure because uh, you have the full five tuple when the, the sin goes through. And so then when you reverse it, you know that the, the traffic will be um, only for something that was initiated and trusted. Um, but the problem is that the, the performance is really bad with this. Because it's actually creating flows, open flow flows, um, we can't cache uh, um, flow creation in the kernel. So all new flow setups have to go up to user space, and that's orders of magnitude slower uh, than if they can ma be maintained in the kernel. And then uh, a drawback with both of these approaches is that um, you, they don't have support for related flows. So for example, if you're doing an FTP connection uh, and you're monitoring the control channel and you download a, a file, then it needs to open a data channel, and that's going to be over a new TCP connection. And these have no way of knowing that the, uh, the data channel uh, was created and that they need to open a hole for that. Uh, they also don't do any sort of uh, TCP window enforcement to make sure that the, the sequence numbers are correct in that TCP session. So what we're doing is we're going to add the ability to do connection tracking in, um, in OVS. And so we're going to do that by leveraging the, the contract module. And this is actually what IP tables uses uh, to implement their, their firewall, or to, to do their firewalling. They use that connection tracker. And so this will allow stateful tracking of flows. Uh, so it will do things like look at the, the sequence numbers. Uh, we also are going, it'll also support um, ALGs that allow those data channels. So for example, the FTP that I mentioned earlier, you allow the control channel through it follows the, um, it actually parses that control channel, and it will then open up, uh, it will then, sorry, let us know that uh, a new flow is related to that flow, and then we are able to then open up a connection there. Uh, and so uh, just a few of the things that are supported in Linux are FTP, TFTP, SIP, but there are a lot of other protocols that it supports as well. And so, you can, as you can imagine, that uh, this is much better than what we were doing before. It's going to have much better performance. Uh, you're able to push down your policies with mega flows um, into the kernel. Um, all of the, the flow state stays in the kernel because the contract module actually runs in the kernel. Um, and uh, you know, so everything, w once you establish that you know, port 80, for example, you want to allow any established flow through, that can actually be wildcarded and stay in the kernel. Uh, and so to do this, we're adding a new action, uh, new OpenFlow extension action, which says send it to the contract module. When you send it to the contract module, the packet will then get recirculated back uh, through the, the pipeline, and then you'll get another chance to look at the packet and then match on the flags related to the connection state. Uh, so in the, the way that the contract module works is it has con state that's related to if the flow is new, established, or related. And so you'll be able to, to implement your policies with that. And so we actually have a prototype working. Uh, it's sitting in one of my, my branches right now. But uh, it's not quite ready um, to be shared yet. But we expect to ship that by the, uh, the end of the year in OVS. <clears throat> so, you know, as you, um, so if you take this connection tracking that we're adding and uh, add the, the guest introspection and um, state inference that we were talking about earlier, uh, we can implement a really advanced firewall now. And because we know precisely what user or what application is generating the traffic, we can now uh, inf make very fine-grained decisions as opposed to just very basic ones based on the, the five tuple. So for um, elephant flows is uh, the last topic that we'll go over. So there was some research uh, done in data centers that indicated that the majority of flows in the network are uh, short-lived, which they call mice, but that the majority of packets in the network are long-lived, which are called elephants. And so the, the mice tend to be uh, bursty and latency-sensitive, and the elephants tend to transfer a large amount of data, 
but they're less concerned about latency. Uh, and so you can imagine that as the, the elephants are sending their traffic, they can fill up the network buffers, which uh, introduce latency in the mice because the, the mice are coming through after the, the, the elephants have filled up these buffers and they have to wait for the elephants to make their way through. So you can imagine sort of like a theoretical bank that is running uh, a backup and that backup is you know, filling up the network uh, buffers as the traffic is flowing through. And the, um, then you have mice flows, which might be uh, transactions, uh, database transactions that need to go through. And those you actually want to get through very quickly. And so you end up slowing down these, um, these mice flows as the elephants are, are filling things up. Uh, so one of the nice things is at the edge, because we are what's taking the traffic and putting it into a tunnel, uh, we're able to affect the underlay based on, uh, uh, based on what we're seeing in the overlay. So we have uh, defined multiple mechanisms for detection uh, that, we've been, that we've been playing with. The first one is rate and time, so that we you set, we keep track of all of the flows that are going through OVS, and then we we mark um, we we keep track of how many bytes or at what rate they're sending their traffic, and then we keep track of the time at which the flow has been alive. And so, you, for example, you could say, oh, if this flow is sent, you know, 500 kilobits of traffic or kilobytes of traffic, then it's an elephant flow over the last 10 seconds. And so, uh, once the a flow has done that, we mark it as an elephant. Another thing that we've looked at is uh, large segments, um, which large segments for TCP. And the idea here is that you have a, um, the way that TCP works is you have t this slow start where the traffic starts off by sending uh, not too many segments. And then it, when it gets an acknowledgement that the other side received it, it sends a little bit more. And then once it gets an acknowledgement, it opens up a little bit more. So you have this slow start, so you're sending more and more data as the, or large, more and more, sorry, you have more and more outstanding data in segments um, as the connection has been left open. So what you can do is um, we can look for when those segments start getting large. And the idea is once you get to a certain size, uh, then we know that it's an elephant flow. And this requires a lot less state because all we need to do is look at individual, um, individual transmissions and see how large is the segment. And if it's, for example, 32K, we know it's gone through slow start and it's probably an elephant flow. Uh, and then finally, another option would be uh, guest introspection. So we actually query the guest to find out whether it's an elephant. And there was a paper called uh, Mahout that, that did this. And what they, what they did was they looked at the socket buffer depth uh, for applications in the guest to see how much data they had transferred. And, or sorry, how much, um, how big, how deep the buffers had gotten, and so you know the idea there is that as the the application is sending traffic, if it's sending it at a greater rate that can actually be put on the wire, then this is an elephant flow, and so you know if we have that guest introspection uh, ability, then we can uh, we can do that, we can uh, use that mechanism. <clears throat> uh, so uh, we actually haven't implemented the guest introspection mechanism, uh, but that would be an option, uh, assuming that we have uh, guest introspection running in the guest. Um, and then once we've uh, de determined that a flow is an elephant, um, there are multiple things that, we, that can be done on the network. So one would be that um, you continue to send traffic through the same port, but you use different queues and drain those queues uh, differently. Uh, so that, for example, you drain the mice more quickly than you drain the elephants. Um, you could route the, the elephants differently from the mice just through your existing network, uh, you know, choose different ECMP links, for example. Um, or you could, if you had an optical network, for example, you could actually just route the, the traffic along that optical, the, sorry, the elephants along that optical network and then you leave the mice just using uh, the traditional network. Or you could just, um, you know, mark it and then just have the underlay, if the underlay is intelligent to know what to do, then it just figures it out. We've just identified that it's it's an elephant and the, the underlay can do whatever it wants. So this is a picture of a, of a typical NSX deployment that VMware does. And so you, can, you have the, the two hypervisors and this uh, NSX control cluster that's managing everything. And so if VM1 and VM2 are in the same logical network, they will, um, their traffic will be um, placed in a tunnel by OpenVSwitch and sent to each other. 
And if you're using VXLAN, the different, um, even though we call them that the traffic is in a tunnel, they're actually different tunnels depending on the traffic. So that uh, the VXLAN uses different source ports for um, based on the a hash of the uh, the inner packet. So that way you can um, that if you had an elephant, you could have an elephant flow and a mice mouse flow, and those will actually look on the wire as different flows, even though they're both running in a VXLAN tunnel. So as I mentioned, that Open vSwitch is really an optimal location to do the, this handling of elephant flows because it has a flow level view of all of the traffic that the hypervisor, or the, through the hypervisor, uh, that the VMs are generating uh, and receiving. And it also knows the mapping between the logical and the physical addresses. We've developed this so that the detection and the action occur separately um, so that we can use, um, we can evolve them independently and we can also, depending on who the user is, uh, they can use different detection mechanisms or different actions. So currently in the, the code that, that we've been developing, uh, the two detection mechanisms that we support are uh, rate and time and the large segment size, which I described. And then once we've detected that an elephant flow, or that a flow is an elephant, uh, we support two actions. One is to mark the DSCP bits in the outer IP header, and um, so that way that the underlay is aware that, you know, that this elephant or this flow is an elephant, this packet is an elephant, and that you should treat it differently. Um, or we uh, put it in the OVS DB, which is this config database that OVS supports. Um, we put it up, we identify the packet as it will look on the wire um, in an OVS DB column, and then there's an underlay agent that is able to respond to that. <clears throat> so uh, we'll, First example will be that uh, underlay agent that I talked about. So in here you can see that the, um, if let's say hypervisor one is generating traffic and then it's sending traffic to hypervisor two and it's going through these two switches, the, when a f elephant has been identified, it, there will be a, it'll be written to the a column in uh, OVSDB. There's an NSX elephant agent that is running up here that is monitoring OVSDB, the OVSDBs in both these hypervisors. And it, it triggers on when that column changes. And so when it learns that there's a new elephant flow, uh, it uses a, uh, an API call to the SDN controller to inform it that, uh, that this is an elephant. And then the SDN controller then programs all the switches under its control to treat those flows differently. And so in this way, there's no marking of the packets. It's just identified uh, through this uh, SDN agent. And this is something that we actually uh, developed and was, um, was shown as a technology preview at an HP conference in December. So this is something that we, we got, got working with HP. Something that we've been working on with other uh, um, hardware vendors is treating elephant flows differently based on the, or identifying elephant flows with DSCP markings. So we actually mark the outer IP header. And so the, uh, the switches, the hardware switches, are configured to treat um, f f um, traffic with that DSCP value differently. So it will, um, you know, so if these were configured, for example, to route the traffic differently depending on whether the DSCP value was set or not, uh, then they will do that. So you can imagine there'd be two links here and the mice would go over one and the elephants would go over the other. And we're actually working on an internet draft to describe uh, recommended DSCP values. So we've developed this, uh, we, we've done some testing with Cumulus networks. And so what we did was we gave them a modified OVS that detects elephant flows by counting the numbers of bytes for each flow. And then there, once that then you can configure the, uh, the threshold for when it's defined as an, detected as an elephant. And once that line is crossed, then we'll start ma um, marking those flows or the, the, the tunnels if they're being carried in tunnels with a flag, or, or sorry, with a DSCP value that indicates that. And the cumulus switches were configured to place the elephant marked flows into an alternate queue. And so this is the, the test setup uh, that was used. So the, the VMs are communicating, are sending traffic to that system on the bottom. That's the, the, the sync of the traffic. So the, the vSwitch, uh, the modified vSwitch is running here. It sends its traffic uh, over a 10 gig link to the, the Cumulus switch. Then the Cumulus sends all of the traffic over this one gig link 
um, to another cumulus switch, which then has a 10 gig link down. So you can see that this, is, this one gig link is a bottleneck. And so the, um, and the way that this was configured, or the, when we, def you, know, you could imagine that once a, flat, sorry, once a flow has been identified as an elephant, we could send it over the 10 gig link, but what we did instead was um, just put it into a different queue and treat those packets differently. So they're going over the same port, but elephants are in one queue and the uh, mice are in another one. So we used uh, NetTCP to generate the elephants and uh, mice a, uh, a ping with a small interval. And so these are the results. So in the green here on the left, this is the elephant flow, and this is the bandwidth in megabits per second. If you can't see it, it just it goes from 500 megabits per second to uh, 1,000. And in blue are the mice flows, and this is the latency uh, as measured in the, the mice. And so this goes from 0 to 10 millisecond latency. And so you can see that when the elephant flows are running, so the elephant flows are running, and this is time, and when we introduce the mice, there is, uh, the, the latency is relatively high and variable. And then once we kill the elephant, it drops down to um, you know, under half a millisecond uh, latency. When we introduce the elephant flow detection, uh, you can see that here we've, we've started the, the mice, uh, the, the pings, and now we've introduced the elephant flows. And the elephant flow numbers haven't changed too much, but you can see that the mice um, haven't been really affected at all uh, by the, the elephants, which was, which was a problem before. Uh, so here it is in a uh, tabular form that might be a little easier to read. So you can see that if you only are running the elephants, uh, that the traffic was 941 megabits per second. And then if you only ran the mouse, the mice, then it was uh, less than half a millisecond latency. If you didn't have detection on, the, the, the mice, or sorry, the elephants weren't affected, but the, um, the latency of the, the mice went up by about two and a half uh, milliseconds. Um, and then if we use it with the elephant flow detection, you lose a little bit of the uh, performance of the, of the elephant flow, but the latency of the, the mouse is not very affected. So I had hoped to have the, the code ready to share with everybody um, by the time I did this talk. Unfortunately, it didn't come together in time. Um, but uh, I am planning on sharing the code, and I'll push it up onto to GitHub in a branch uh, next week, most likely. And so the, uh, I re so the, the code that Cumulus and some of the other people um, did was before I wrote it in user space and decided that wasn't really the best way to do it. We had to do things like disable megaflows. So I've re-implemented it as a, as a, in the kernel module. Uh, which has much better performance characteristics. We don't have to do things like disable mega flows. And uh, it will support both the threshold-based detection uh, that we've been talking about and that TSO uh, mechanism. And so the, the idea of the code is really just something to, to try out, see if it's worthwhile, um, see what customers actually find useful, um, and then we may go forward and put this into actual upstream OVS. But, uh, right now, the, the way the code is written, it's really more for like a development platform for um, trying out new mechanisms uh, and um, actions uh, in, in OBS. And so here are a couple of uh, references uh, to, to documents that might be interesting. I'd mentioned the, uh, about the data centers mostly sending, about the um, most packets being mice and um, most bytes being, or sorry, most flows being mice and most uh, data being elephants. That's in this first paper. Um, and then Martin Casado and I wrote a blog post about elephants, uh, elephants and mice in the second one. And then the third one uh, is describing the work that we did with HP for that SDN approach. And uh, that's it. So this is, these are some presentations that, uh, that VMware is also hosting. They asked me to put that up. Um, are there any questions? Uh, you started off by saying um, there will be some sort of an agent that communicates with uh, the uh, guest OS. Mm -hmm. uh, to have that kind of a paradigm, uh, is it possible to do in uh, OBS and OpenStack, or do we have to use some VMware kind of a ESX kind of a platform? 
Well, I mean, I think that the 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 only place that I've seen it right now is in VMware. So, like when you run uh, when you install the VMware tools, like that's where it would install right. that sort of agent. So, I suspect that it's something. I mean, it's something that if there was an open source implementation, OBS could make use of, but I don't know of one right now. So, whatever uh, your change right now is uh, specific to OBS, and it, it doesn't have that uh, the. Um, detection the firewall mechanisms that can be that you talked about in the beginning. So the the connection tracking that I mentioned will be part of the open source OVS. The the guest introspection is something that's being developed um, at VMware. Yeah, I'm Kesho from HP. Uh, I have a question regarding the TCP pacing. Uh, in the in the edge, if there are multiple switches and uh, the the TCP flows are going on the multiple uh, uh, switches, uh, uh, then uh, uh, then how does the TCP pacing works? Well, I mean, I think because you're at the edge, you don't. I mean, it, it's. I think it's like I said, it's an active area of, of research, but the idea is that by spreading out the traffic, that it should smooth things out. I mean, there's no there's no coordination um, that would be done to know like what the effect is on the network. It's something that would be an area of investigation to see if it's something that's practical and useful. Right, because it may I mean drastically it may degrade the performance also, mm -hmm. because I mean uh, uh, instead of uh, instead of improving, it may degrade. Uh, because one switch tries to improve, whereas another switch, it, it, it's not. Whereas the next packet comes on that switch, and uh, that much buffer is not allocated, there is chances of getting drop. Right. Right. Another question is, uh, uh, when you go for IPv6, where it has a built-in path empty mechanism, so how, I mean, is there any advantage in using TCP pacing in case of IPv6? Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Actually, I haven't thought about that, so I'm not I'm not sure. Okay. Pretty good answer. Uh, my name is Keith Edwards from, from Skyline ATS. Uh, w with the idea of adding jitter to the elephant, you're essentially uh, purposely degrading the quality of the elephant, right? Uh, well, I think the the uh, adding jitter was not necessarily just for the elephant. That, that was sort of separate. But yeah, I mean, the idea is yes too. Um, Introduce some latency, yeah. So to introduce some jitter, which would degrade degrading the, the elephant in favor of the mouse a little bit. Well, I don't know if the the jitter wasn't really tied in particular to the elephant, but yes, if you wanted to do that, yes, then that would that would be true. So we were bottom adding, line question yeah. overall: What if the elephant's really important? Well, I mean, I think then it's you know it's up to the network operator, and that's why we're experimenting with this. Okay. You know, so we have talked with uh, with some financial groups, and what they actually want to do is uh, once they identify an elephant, they actually want to send it over a separate optical link. Okay. Cheers. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, is the contract stuff actually available on GitHub in a branch or? No, it's uh, it's something that I did as a as a proof of concept right now, and it's not really um, end user consumable because it, it has uh, so many restrictions. Like it doesn't handle uh, fragment reassembly, uh, so I I didn't push it to a branch. I, mean, okay. I could send a document describing it, or I, mean, I could push it to a branch, but it's not useful right now. Um, so. A uh, couple of uh, other questions. Since the kernel is now moving to like NF tables, mm -hmm. um, is this going to get deprecated at some point? Like, uh, is uh, uh, NetFilter, like the old way of doing it, uh, going to uh, go away from the kernel? And then, what are, what's the what's the plans for that in OBS? Yeah, I actually don't know. I mean, I, I'm familiar with NF table. I don't know what the um, kernel community's plan is for for the contractor in the long term. Um, I know there is a uh, there's a conference in Germany uh, coming up this summer that uh, Colonel uh, the NetDev uh, Network Plumbers and so um, I think some of us are planning on going and I think we'll probably have some discussions about that. Okay, um, is there a sense of uh, performance? Like how many flows can you have before kind of one of the issues we have with contract is um, the CPS connection rate you can right. do takes a major hit like when you enable it. Um, if you're going to do that in OBS, um, do, you, do you have a sense of like what sort of a hit it's going to be? What's the maximum number of flows that you can have in the kernel before you kind of see degradation? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, we've, we haven't done any performance testing. I mean, obviously, we're going to be limited by whatever the, the contract module is capable of doing. Right. Um, but 
you know, I, I think that the idea is that you have, you know, much better security by this. So right. you could, you can define the policy. Like if you have some flows that you're very concerned about, you could imagine using two different mechanisms because this is all flow based. You could detect or decide that some subset of the flow should go through the contract or another shouldn't, you know, based okay. on policies. Right. But yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're going to be limited by the contractor and, uh, you know, if it ends up being a major hit, you know, we've, uh, we've contributed, you know, to improve parts of the kernel in the past. It's the kind of thing that, you know, we might want to look into doing if it's possible. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, two quick questions. The first, for the elephant flow detection, it seems uh, you heavily relies on the TCP. So how about uh, if the elephant flow is not TCP, is the UDP based or RTSP or whatever the video things? Right. So the uh, so obviously the segment size detection wouldn't work, um, but uh, doing it based on the amount of data that's transferred for the five tuple would work okay. for for UDP. Okay. And um, second thing is, yeah, you mentioned when you are saying about the firewall implementation, you mentioned about performance thing. Uh, if that flow have to uh, go to <coughs> user and then go back to kernel, where there's a performance hit. Yes. Um, I just wonder, does that change things if later on? I know TPDK Intel was doing something with OVS. Does that change things if TPDK hook up with OVS and all this bypass the kernel? So in, in the case of if you use DPDK, the, the kernel's entirely bypassed. So you wouldn't get any of the features that are, so you wouldn't get the connection tracker, you wouldn't get QOS you know, that we use from TC. So you, you end up having to implement all of those things in user space to gotcha. use DPDK. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? All right, thank you. I'll be up here if any other questions.